We're really known in America's Test Kitchen for getting under the hood of recipes and really understanding how they work. And we've been doing this now for more than 20 years. We've got 40 people working in a test kitchen, uh, developing and testing recipes. And a couple years ago, I said, you know what, we've learned so much about cooking. We should sort of put all of that general information, kind of all of the best practices, all of the science that we've learned over 20 years into one big book to explain to people how cooking really, uh, you know, the chemistry and the physics, what's really happening when you're cooking. Let's, let's tackle a few of those, and we'll start with very basic elements of cooking, heat and time involved in preparing a dish. And there's, a, there's like a balancing act with those two, right? Yes. I mean, it's, you know, it's all about, um, you know, balancing both of those things. I mean, when it comes to heat, you know, when, when we're cooking, um, you know, we're often transforming foods uh, into a either safer or more palatable steak. Right. Uh, you know, um, nobody really wants to eat a raw steak. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I guess if you grind it up for steak tartare. Right. There might um, be a few, yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, cooking it makes it uh, much more palatable. But, you know, cooking develops flavor. You know, the, any food that's browned is going to be more flavorful. And hot, like some, high heat and fast cooking tends to be more toward the flavor side, right? And slow cooking more for tender with meats? Right. And, you know, um, because at some point you move from developing flavor to accelerating the moisture loss. And so generally, you know, a lot of recipes have um, a combination of those two things. It might start off with high heat but then go very gentle because what you're trying to do is make sure that you don't have too much moisture loss. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, people always are asking me, what's the secret to a juicy steak? And I was like, don't overcook it. That's the secret. Um, <laughs> That's a the, Yeah, well, the, the higher, the t- what's happening is, you know, it, it, the, the fibers uh, are contracting. And basically, the more you cook it, the more the muscle fibers contract and the more juices that get expelled. Mm. And so a steak that's cooked to 145 degrees, kind of medium well, is always going to be less juicy than a steak that's cooked to medium rare, which is about 125 degrees. And do I understand it correctly that browning the meat ahead of time does not seal in the juices, as people might think? It does absolutely nothing for sealing in the juices. The only thing you can do to keep juices in place is to not overcook meat. Uh Um, That the searing step that a lot of recipes begin with is really important for developing a browned crust, and that browned crust makes the steak taste better, Mm -hmm. but it does nothing to do with juiciness. If you want to hold on to some juices once the meat is prepared, you need to let it rest before you start carving it. This is something that my parents have long said uh, when they would... uh, bring a meat, you know, like a big steak off the grill when I was growing up. Uh, They'd let it sit in the kitchen for a little bit before they started carving it up. Yeah, this is one of the biggest mistakes that um, novice cooks make is that, you know, they're making the holiday turkey, they're making a big roast, they're making a steak, and they immediately want to serve it um, because they're, you know, it's hot. We've got to get it to the table quickly. Well, the problem is that if you go to carve that holiday turkey or roast, you're going to have a flood of juices all over your carving board, and that's because, you know, during the heating process, um, the fibers are really contracting. And if you let that roast rest for, you know, a small roast should rest 10 or 15 minutes, a larger roast maybe 20 minutes, it will relax. And we found that you can actually reduce the amount of juices that are lost by up to 40% by letting the roast rest before you go ahead and slice and serve it. As much as 40%, that's a lot. It's the difference between, you know, dry, tough meat that you need gravy for yeah. and, and juicy meat. And, you wow. know, you've gone to all that work to cook it. You don't want to blow it in that last, you know, <laughs> final step no. by slicing into it too soon and all the ju- juices ending up on the cutting board where they don't do anybody any good. Now, carving up the meat, that's the end of the process. At the beginning of the process, for some people, there's marinating. And uh, you and your colleagues uh, there at America's Test Kitchen say... Uh, no, do not use acid-based or acidic marinades, but yes, toward the brine or the salty versions. Yeah, there's this theory that um, acid-based marinades so with lime juice, lemon juice, wine, vinegar, will tenderize the meat. And you know what? They don't tenderize the meat. They will make the exterior of the meat a little bit mushy, but what they're actually doing is drawing the natural juices in, in the meat or the chicken out of it, and so you end up with a drier piece of food that's a little bit mushy on the outside, but it's not really tender or juicy. 
if you use a salty marinade, um, either that has salt itself or a salty ingredient like soy sauce, that salt basically penetrates into the meat and it's like a brine. And you are, in effect, brining the meat and the salt changes the structure of the muscle protein so that they are able to hold on to the natural juices in the meat much better. The salt also brings some of those flavors. So if you've got garlic, for instance, in your marinade, when the salt is traveling through uh, via osmosis into the cellular structure of the meat, it's carrying the flavors of the garlic with it. And so you end up with more flavor uh, being penetrated deep into the meat when you've got salt rather than acid as the main ingredient. I know that mushy meat taste that you're talking about, and I never connected it to the meat literally being broken down by those acids. And that's basically what happens. That outer layer, right, just gets that um, anyone who's who's had it knows what I'm talking about. It's that yucky sort of mush uh, taste. Yeah, and it's really mostly about flavor. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the main reason you want to marinate a, a piece of meat or a piece of chicken is for flavor, not texture. I mean, people think, oh, you're going to take a tough steak, you know, a cheap cut, and somehow a marinade is going to transform it into filet mignon. That's not going to happen. Um, it might, it'll make it taste well, like whatever it is that's in the marinade. Um, that's the main reason you would be marinating something. Didn't there used to be like a like a sprinkle that you could put on meat that was supposed to help tenderize? Uh, did that basically do what you're saying? Just make it mushy and not better? Yeah, the the accent accent uh, was, yes, uh-huh. and it has an enzyme that's derived from papayas. Believe it or not, uh-huh. um, it's called papayan, and it has the ability to make uh, break down muscle fiber and make it mushy. It doesn't really make it tender, but that's basically what it was doing. It was a dried version of something that's in, in papaya. Right. Um, and we don't recommend that either at the test kitchen. Now, you were, you were talking about uh, that flavor is the key, of course. There are some uh, elements that really boost flavor. They're known as glutamates and uh, they are controversial <laughs> in some circles, especially if you call it a monosodium glutamate. Uh, how do glutamates work, and what are the misconceptions around them? Well, first of all, let's start off by explaining that glutamates are naturally occurring. Um, so red wine, garlic, onions, tomatoes, soy sauce, uh, Parmesan cheese all have naturally occurring glutamates. Um, And what the glutamates do is they um, stimulate what the fifth sense. I mean, we all grew up in, you know, if we went to an American school, we learned that there were four tastes, um, sweet and salty and sour and bitter. But there's actually a fifth taste. It's called umami. And a Japanese scientist discovered this about a century ago. And now pretty much scientists around the world agree that there are five tastes. And this umami is for lack of a better word, meatiness or savoriness. Mm -hmm. Um, And, uh, you know, it's kombu. Seaweed has a lot of glutamates in it. Uh, You know, if you think about that savory quality of really good Parmigiano-Reggiano, that's because it's rich in glutamates. And so we will often, in a lot of our recipes in the test kitchen, use these ingredients that are rich in glutamates to ramp up meaty flavors. So if we're making a, you know, a beef and vegetable soup or we're making a beef stew, we often will use a little tomato paste, which is a really concentrated source of glutamates, in order to bring out the full flavor of um, the beef in it. Uh, and so it's a, really, uh, you know, it's a really great way to make something taste better and more appealing. And you know, a lot of restaurant chefs sort of do this uh, intuitively, but the science here is pretty strong. And what about people who, we only have a short moment before the commercial break, but people that say they're sensitive to monosodium glutamate, are they also sensitive to these naturally occurring forms? Yeah, I mean, it's a complicated subject. Most of the people who think they're uh, you know, sensitive to MSG might actually be sensitive to something else. Um, you know, there haven't been any studies to really document that sensitivity. Um, and these naturally occurring glutamates, you know, they're in everything from, as I say, onions to garlic to, uh, to seafood. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's very, I've never really heard of anyone being allergic to that compound. Right. We're speaking with Jack Bishop, chef and editorial director at America's Test Kitchen on PBS, the new book, The Science of Good Cooking. 
I have to say it is, we get a lot of books here at Eat, Drink, Explore. <laughs> they come to the door every couple of days. This is my favorite that I've looked at uh, so far. And so we'll be back in just a, more, in just a moment with more, uh, including how to make a perfect omelet. You're listening to Eat, Drink, Explore. And we're back in a second. Randall White here, host of Eat, Drink, Explore Radio, with a tip for Central Coast wine tasting. Eberly Winery was recently voted Winery of the Year by the world's top sommeliers and has one of the best local tours, according to Wine Spectator. Eberly Winery opened daily 10 to 6, and the winery's cave tours and wine tasting always complimentary. It's easy to find, too. Located on Highway 46 East, just three and a half miles from Highway 101. Now it's time to plan your visit. Just head to eberlywinery.com. The traditional light bulb, a groundbreaking invention in 1879. Other groundbreaking ideas from that time, the whalebone corset, the pedal-operated submarine, and the two-story outhouse. We've come a long way since then. It's time our light bulbs did the same. Visit energysavers.gov and learn about energy-saving light bulbs. See, these new bulbs are more efficient than the old ones, like a text message is more efficient than a carrier pigeon. They last longer, too. Like how we humans last longer now that doctors use antibiotics instead of leeches. And they cut down on our energy costs. Because in our own groundbreaking age of aeroplanes and moving pictures, we deserve a light bulb that saves us some cash. Saving energy saves you money. Learn more at energysavers.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Energy and the Ad Council. Randall White here, host of Eat, Drink, Explore Radio, with a tip for Central Coast wine tasting. Eberly Winery was recently voted Winery of the Year by the world's top sommeliers and has one of the best local tours, according to Wine Spectator. Eberly Winery opened daily 10 to 6, and the winery's cave tours and wine tasting always complimentary. It's easy to find, too. Located on Highway 46 East, just three and a half miles from Highway 101. Now it's time to plan your visit. Just head to eberlywinery.com. The Eat, Drink, Explore media radio show you are currently enjoying is in a local affiliate commercial break. Live programming will return shortly. Did you know you can watch a live video simulcast of our Sunday morning and Thursday evening shows from your computer, smartphone, or tablet device? And to top it off, it's free. Simply head to eatdrinkexplore.com or download our free app from the Google Play or Apple App Store. If you have a suggestion for an upcoming guest segment, send an email to radio at eatdrinkexplore.com. We're always looking for fresh ideas, including yours. We love to share fresh, local, organic, seasonal, and sustainable ideas throughout the week. And the best place to find those are on our Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook feeds. Our username across the social networking universe is simple. Eat, drink, explore, all one word. Hey, college students, Eat, Drink, Explore Media is always looking for qualified journalism or marketing interns. Send us an email today so we can check your status and put you on the list for upcoming intern vacancies. Would you like to hear this Eat, Drink, Explore radio program on one of your local radio stations? Let the station know and contact us as well so we can get the ball rolling. Okay, you made it. The local affiliate commercial break is now over. Time for more informative and entertaining programming from Eat, Drink, Explore Media. Thank you for your patience. And welcome back to the final segment here of the Eat, Drink, Explore radio network on this Sunday morning. Great to have you with us, and welcome back to Jack Bishop, chef and editorial director at America's Test Kitchen on PBS, the new book, The Science of Good Cooking. You can find it at a local bookstore near you or online. We have links 
under today's program summary at eatdrinkexplore.com. Jack, when we left off, we were talking about glutamates and how they really ramp up food flavor. Uh, I just purchased some fish sauce the other day uh, for a recipe that I was making. Uh, People, you find it a lot in uh, Asian cooking. That's high in glutamates, is it not? It's a really concentrated source of uh, glutamates. I mean, fish sauce works much the way soy sauce does in a lot of Asian recipes and just, you know, brings out um, other flavors. And, uh, you know, it has a very intense smell, but when you're using it in (laughs) recipes, you don't really quite uh, pick that out quite as much as you do if you just take a whiff of uh, the bottle of fish sauce. Yeah, it cooks off uh, pretty quickly, and every time I use it, somebody says, wow, this tastes great. (laughs) Now we know why. It's the glutamates that are in there. Now, I'm more of a bean person than a meat person. Uh, I want to address a concept in the book that recommends using a brine prior to cooking and then cooking with salt. I personally don't pre-soak of the beans. I don't use salt when I'm cooking, and I use a pressure cooker. I love how the beans come out, but then when I looked at the photos in the book, I did realize my beans do kind of fall apart. I typically end up mashing them anyway, so I so I don't concern myself with that. But if you brine them ahead of time, apparently, and use salt while cooking, you really get a nicely shaped bean at the end. Yeah, for us, what we are, our goal is to get a bean that is creamy in the middle, but still has an intact uh, skin. And so it's not really simply a aesthetic issue. You know, if you are if you have um, the skin split, it can make the dish very starchy. Now, if you're trying to mash the beans for refried beans, obviously that's a good thing. Mm-hmm. But if you're using the beans, let's say, in a pasta soup, um, I'm not sure you really want all that starchiness from the beans. And so if you can get the skin to cook up tender but intact and the inside to be creamy, that's the goal, and we found that rather than just soaking the beans, which basically just cuts the cooking time. So mm-hmm. if you soak the beans overnight, you know, if they would take two hours on the stovetop to cook normally, if you were taking them right out of the bag, they'll probably take 90 minutes if you soak them. Um, they also just hydrate a little bit better, and they cook a little bit more evenly if they are soaked. And if you add some salt to that soaking liquid, um, and in fact, brine the beans, they also tend not to burst when you go to cook them. And so we recommend uh, brining the beans uh, if you're cooking dried beans before you cook them. What I love about this book is it breaks so many myths that people pass along to each other. And one of the things that I had been told, the reason why I don't use salt, one is for health reasons, but uh, secondly is I was told that it would make the beans hard that when you cook them, but uh, that's not the case. No, no. If you go way overboard and put way too much salt in, you can slow down the absorption of the water by the beans. But the main reason why beans sometimes don't cook properly is because your water is hard. Um, Uh And there's really nothing that the salt is going to do to affect that. Um, You can add a little pinch of baking soda if you've got really hard water. Um, you know, hard water just means that you've got a lot of calcium and magnesium and other uh, minerals in it that are really slowing down the absorption of uh, the water into the beans. Um, or you can, of course, use bottled water, which would get around the issue of hard tap water. All right, it's breakfast time right now. A lot of people either cooking eggs or preparing to cook eggs. Uh, and the key with this are the proteins, right? Yes, so eggs are basically proteins that are coagulating, meaning that they are turning from liquid to solid. And you want to encourage that in, to happen, but you don't want it to happen in such a way that it squeezes out all the moisture. And then you, if you do that, you end up with sort of tough, dry eggs. So fat is always an important part of any egg recipe because it sort of lubricates the protein strands so that they uh, coagulate in a sort of loose way rather than in a tight network. Ah, and so when you're cooking like an omelet, you want to beat some fat into the uh, into the mixture, or do you want to use more yolks? Um, both of those things. I mean, when we are cooking an omelet, we will dice up a little bit of butter uh, into small little pits and stir that into the eggs so that as the omelet is cooking, the butter is melting and the fat that's in that butter is uh, coating those proteins in the eggs, and you end up with a very, you know, nicely set, soft, tender uh, omelet. And um, the water that's also in the butter is really important because the butter is about 18% water and the rest is fat, and the water turns to steam, and that makes the eggs a little bit lighter and fluffier. Uh, I was going to, my next question was going to 
the type of fat matter, because in our home we use a lot of olive and grapeseed oil, really for cooking just about everything. Uh, but in that case, there is no water content. That's right. Any oil is 100% fat. You know, that's one of the big differences between butter and oil um, is that the water content in the butter, which can be a good thing in some recipes or it could be a bad thing depending on what the recipe is. Now, on the same topic of eggs, uh, a lot of people like to poach their eggs, but end up with, if you don't have one of those uh, sort of uh, double boiler poachers, uh, if you're actually doing it in the water, it can turn into egg drop soup <laughs> if, you don't, if you don't do it right. So uh, what are your recommendations? Add some vinegar to the water. Uh -huh. uh, that's the first thing. So you're, you're changing the pH of the water, and that will help the whites coagulate more quickly so that they don't become so feathery and spread out. The second thing is um, bring the water to a boil, then turn off the temperature and slide the eggs into the pan. And then cover the pan and let the residual heat in the pan poach the eggs. The reason you're doing this is if you leave the heat on, the water is going to come back to a boil, and those big bubbles are going to basically blow apart the egg. And so you're going to end up with egg drop soup. So a little bit of vinegar, bring the water to a boil, turn it off, and then add the eggs and put the cover on and use residual heat to cook the eggs. And I guess if your end goal is egg drop soup, then you don't want to put vinegar in the water. <laughs> you want to, is, there, is there an opposite method to make sure that it all does feather out? Uh, uh, yes. I mean, stirring constantly as you add the eggs, adding the eggs in a steady stream, and adding some cornstarch to the soup before you add the eggs so uh -huh. that the soup itself is a little thicker, mm -hmm. and that way the eggs are going to be suspended more easily in the soup, and that if you add, uh, you, you just add it to sort of plain broth, the liquid's really not that thick, and you end up often with the eggs dropping all the way to the bottom of the pot. Well, so many more great categories we can't even get to. If you want to learn how to make the perfect uh, pie crust, you name it, they're, they're all handled in this one book, and I'll say it again, the best book to be dropped off at our door here at Eat Drink Explore in a, if, uh, in a really long time, if not in ever. <laughs> I didn't say that very well, but you get the point. Jack Bishop, chef and editorial director at America's Test Kitchen on PBS. Thank you so much for your time today. My pleasure. And that does it. Uh, you can hear more segments from this week's and previous week's show online at eatdrinkexplore.com. Plus, we provide links to all of our guests' website as well, including Jack's uh, there, so you can order the book. Uh, don't forget to download our smartphone and tablet device apps via the Apple Store and Google Play. It is absolutely free. Thank you to Patty Piper and my terrific co-host who had to take off early today. Cora Adam, our studio producer and the woman working the phones. Anthony Renaro in charge of audio. Ricardo Teodosio, my husband and our director of social media. I'm your host, Randall White, saying for all of us here at Eat, Drink, Explore Radio, we'll catch you back here next week and ciao You've for now. You've been listening to the Eat, Drink, Explore Radio program. If you missed any of our segments today, look for them online or through our free Apple and Android apps. Catch you back right here next week.